Hey, welcome back friends and neighbors. How are we doing today? Glad you stopped in to see me. Uh, happy 4th of July, Independence Day. I've been watching the skies. I hadn't seen any weird ships. Uh, I have been out early morning looking for more pigs and uh, had one go behind me yesterday. I couldn't get on him fast enough, but that big boy is still out there. Tomorrow morning, got a date with destiny. I think you got him figured out. I hope I have him figured out. Anyway, a uh, little video here on um, a rifle that some of you, most of you have probably seen them now and then in the shops and maybe you had a hunting buddy or your dad or your granddad had one. Um, Remington 742 semi-auto gas operated hunting rifle. This one is in the regular full length. They made them in carbine as well. This is the BDL grade. It's got the squared off fore end with the pretty wood on the front. Monte Carlo cheek piece on the back. This one's chambered in 30 out 6. Um, Remington made just just under 1.5 million of these guns. They only made them for 20 years, from 1960 to 1980. Uh, by the serial number on this and the Remington site, this one checks to be made sometime between 1969 and 1971. So it's been around the horn a time or two, but it's in damn fine shape, except for the front sight. Somehow the very top rib of it got busted off a long time ago. This isn't my weapon. Uh, my good buddy Chris, that allows me to use his range, inherited this weapon. It came to him in inheritance from his uncle. And I guess it had been his uncle's father's rifle. Anyway, he'd never messed with one before and wanted to get it sighted in and set up. And last weekend, that's exactly what we did. Didn't take too long. Far less than two boxes of ammo. Um, it's really a, a fairly accurate rifle. A lot of people, you know, some some of the colloquial terms that are attached to this specific model of rifle over the decades earlier were you either got a good one or you've got a bad one. And there are a couple of idiosyncrasies of the rifle that usually cause that to happen. Um, but this one did a dang fine job. Um, had a couple of times where the cases came out kind of light, but I think that was just due to the fact that rifle wasn't being held very firmly. Um, but every time it cycled, it fed, and it kept a pretty damn good group with two different types of ammunition. Um, works like a champ so far. Anyway, Chris wanted me to bring it home give it a good going through, take it apart, make sure everything was there, make sure everything was clean and ready to run. So I did that and I got her back together and ready to go. Um, and from the looks of the internals, it didn't get shot a lot. So a lot of times when you see these, especially a used one that's 40 or 50 years old, they have a tendency to look pretty bad. Of course, you know, they were hunting rifles, they were bounced around in the truck, and, hunted in the rain, banged off of trees and stuff. This one's in damn fine shape, really, with the exception of the loss of that front sight rib. But it's got everything else. So we're just, he said, why don't you do a video on it? And I said, well, okay, let's do a video on a Remington 742 and .30-06. Now, when they first came out, they were cranking these out in 257 Roberts and 300 Savage. They had them in 270 Winchester. They had them in 6 millimeter Remington. Eventually had them in 30 out 6 and 308, had them in 280 Remington um, and 7mm Express, which is basically the same thing, just a different name. But this one's out 6, has the detachable four, four shot box magazine, and there's a couple of idiosyncrasies on this that we're going to cover in case you've just ever been curious about one. I'm going to go ahead and tear it down again, kind of give you some pointers on what you're doing and when to do it. And hopefully, uh, it'll be interesting to you. It'll be something that you enjoy. And if you own one of these, you never took it apart because you didn't have the manual, this will help you get her done. So stand by. We're going to adjust camera angles and get this puppy set up on the cleaning table. And 
take a little dive into the Remington 742 Woodmaster. Stand by. All right, here we go. Now, for all you safety Nazis, this weapon is already unloaded. I know that, but I'm going to check it anyway. Always do that anytime you get ready to mess with a weapon, whether you're going to shoot it, clean it, or just show it to somebody. Make sure that weapon is unloaded. Make sure that weapon is safe. The way we're going to do that, one of the uh, little old idiosyncrasies I spoke about on this weapon. The bolt has to be forward to remove the magazine. And that is by pushing the button on the left side of the magazine. That's where the bolt release is, right there on the magazine. That's because it actuates the follower at the rear of the magazine, allowing the bolt to go forward. Nothing in it. Push the button. It goes forward. Kind of weird. The actual magazine release is right here at the rear of the magazine between the magazine and the trigger guard. Just push it up and forward. The magazine pops right out. There we go. All right. Now your bolt will not stay to the rear once you remove a magazine. It will always move forward. Okay. First thing you need to do, well I won't say first, one thing you need to do at one or two points at the first of the disassembly is to remove the forend. Now one of the other things you can do is remove the trigger group in that assembly. That comes out just like on a Remington 1100 or an 870 or a lot of the different Remington shotguns you've seen two pins right back here that holds this in. Okay, You can take this out first and then take off the forend or you can turn them around either way. Let's do the forend first and is how we're going to start at the front. Now, <laughs> see this big ass screwdriver? It isn't because it's the only screwdriver guys because you're going to need a big ass screwdriver. The screw that holds this forearm in goes in the front and here is a picture of it. Hey, like that, that's a big old screw. <laughs> All right. Get a good grip on it. Now, can't really over tighten this I mean unless you really try to hoss it but once it goes down firm and stops moving that's all you need okay and I'm gonna show you something else about this screw it's kind of wild and weird there's a certain point and it's in line with the slot head itself, this will come out. If it's not turned to the right position, it won't come out. You don't just loosen it and pull it out and fall out. And if you loosen it, it doesn't come out, even though you can tell it's loose, don't freak out and keep screwing. You don't need to do that. Simply grab the head, turn it counterclockwise, because it's keyed. It has flats here on the screws at the front. So remember that. Next thing you do, pull your forearm off. Comes right off. See that? Ain't that cool? All right. Ow. I guess I should have put some shoes on if I was going to get around a metal leg table, huh? <laughs> now, the next thing we can do is either take down the front end assembly where the gas block the recoil spring, the recoil spring guide rod, and the action bars are at. Or we can go ahead and pull the trigger group. Might as well pull the trigger group. Now, those pins drive out either direction. I'm not going to use the hammer head with my punch. I'm just going to tap it with wood because they are in there rather snugly. 
And the last thing we want to do is damage a weapon, whether we own it or not. Okay. Make sure that the weapon is on safe, because when you pull this trigger assembly out, you don't want it to be able to accidentally disengage itself, because it'll throw shit. Guarantee it, it'll throw shit. You can drive these pins out. Front to back, back to front, doesn't matter. You got a big and you got a little one, just like on an 870 or 1100 or 1148. Push them bad boys out. Now, something you do need to be mindful of, idiosyncrasy number two, because there is a piece that extends from the trigger group and sits directly in front of the end of the action bar on the left side, you want to remember that when you pull this out, when you get ready to take it out, just lift it out, Kind of pull the back end up and lift it forward. This arm right here, you don't want to get hung up or bound up on anything. You don't want to bend that. You don't want to put any stress or pressure on it, okay? Not a good time. So, there's the trigger assembly, and that exposes the interior of your receiver where your bolt assembly is sitting on those action rods that have a carrier plate. Kind of like 870s do, but not a separate plate that just lays on top of them. So stand by and I'll get you a picture of that. Kind of pretty in there, ain't it? <laughs> All right. Next thing we're gonna do going to take this portion we're not going to remove the action bars because to do that there's a action nut and barrel nut that has to have a specific style of tool unless it's your gun you don't give a shit if it looks ugly and then you can get on it with something maybe you uh, like a custom cut box end wrench that because there's no room to get down the sides of the flats right here by the action bars and you certainly don't want to bend them. So, uh, stand by, let's get ready for that. Okay, there's a good view into the interior of the receiver. The bolt is in battery. We still haven't removed the recoil operational rods or the springs or anything. So, just kind of give you a little view. You see this has several lugs in three different placements on the bolt. As it goes forward, you can see the corresponding, hopefully you can see the corresponding grooves at the forward end. And as that goes in, it's a rotary bolt. And it just comes in and out. Locks that puppy up. It's like 12 or 14 of them damn things in there. There's a lot. You can also see here, inside the travel pathway, I've got that cleaned off so that you can get a, a good hard look at it. On a, a lot of these weapons, when you find especially the, what you might call well used or hard used, a lot of times they'll have some damage right here along the edges of these raceways. Now this one has just a little chattering. See those four little nodes? That's usually due to the lugs on the bolt making contact with the side of that channel. Now when I put this back together I'm going to put grease in there. Not a lot, just a little bit. But there does need to be some grease there. There also needs to be some grease on the bottom of the bolt. You see that wear mark? This rides right over the top of the hammer every time it cycles. So that needs a little grease. Also, the lugs themselves and their locking recesses get just a little bit of grease. So before I put this back together, I'll put some on there. Now, some people will tell you also, you can see the edge right here of a cutout rail. 
and there's also a corresponding slot on the other side for the action bars to go in. Some people tell you never use oil. Well, it, old school oil, yeah, wasn't very good for it. It's best to use grease. Now I know a lot of you guys are going to be like, oh my God, it's hunting gun. The grease is just going to collect crap and dirt and crud and stuff. And you're like, yeah, well, it, it might if you drag it behind the Jeep. But this weapon, the way it's put together, the way it's machined, grease will give you longer lasting lubrication. It will give you a better lubricity with longer lasting application. It's going to stay in there. Oil eventually is gone. Oil goes away. That's why you got to keep oil in shit. Grease, it stays there a while. All right, so let's change camera angles and we'll pull the uh, recoil spring, recoil spring guide rod. Take that front of the action down anyway. Let you kind of see how to go about doing that and a couple of the idiosyncrasies that are a part of that little chore. Stand by. Okay, we've got our unit set up now and I've got the camera angle set so I can show you a couple of things you need to be mindful of. To start the disassembly on this end, one of the first things you're going to do is press out this roll pin. Now I've seen this roll, I've seen these roll pins be in there so damn tight that you got to drive them out with a punch. And I've seen other roll pins which you could slide out with your fingers. This is the latter. You can, you can literally poke that out with your finger. And that's okay. It doesn't hurt it a bit. It stays in place. There are metal framing guards inside the hand guard on the forearm that keep that from moving any appreciable distance. When we do that, we're going to move the action bars and the gas box back, hold them with our hand. When we punch this out, and you saw it move just with my finger, okay, so that we can remove that recoil spring guide rod, that silver tube, and that is a guide rod. It is not a gas tube. No gas goes in there. You see how when you bring it back, you can actually see how the rod only goes down half the width of the opening of the mouth of that rod. It's a hollow tube, but nothing goes inside it. And it only goes that far, and that is its proper position, and it stays there. Okay. Before we start on that, remember that barrel nut, action nut that I spoke of? That's it right there. Now, a couple of different places used to make tools that you could use to put on a 3 8 breaker bar, quarter inch breaker bar, whatever, to access that that had extremely thin but very hard, very strong side jaws. And you could utilize that to break that loose if it's on there really, really, really tight. Uh, if you're lucky and two of the flats line up and are exposed in just the right place, you might get on it <laughs> with some other kind of wrench, but I would not recommend that, okay? There's no real reason to take that nut off unless you're actually having to pull the barrel itself out of the weapon and you want to remove the bolt for some type of repair that needs to take place and most of your competent gunsmiths are going to have a tool that will do that. You can find them online on eBay for about $55. So good luck with that. Alright, I'm going to change my position. One other thing you have to remember when you're going about this this recoil spring is shrouded up in a hollow portion here on the block. When you bring this up to pull that guide rod, you're going to be pulling it from the front. And the spring is still going to be under compression somewhat. You need to cover it with your hand or it's going to take off 
God knows which direction. And although it's just a, a spring, and yeah, it, it's big, you probably won't lose it, unless you're doing it out in the middle of the damn field. If that puppy comes out of there and heads right for your face and hits you with one end, especially if it hits you in the eye, you're not going to be happy about it, okay? So let's go ahead and bring her out now. So we're going to bring this back, hold it with our hand. Bring our pin out. When we do, this is going to allow us to lift the end of the tube and this yoke, which you can now move backwards, is going to stay on unless you want to pull it off. Just grab the front of the tube, let the block come forward a little bit so that you can make clearance of the gas block itself. At this point, you want to get back there, cover that spring, okay? You don't want it coming out of there. You can give this a little pull back. Get that yoke out of your way. Pull that tube forward. Yoke out of the way. A little more. Okay. Eventually it'll come off. It's going to come out. Or you can give yourself just a little more clearance. Now see that spring back end came out. And it wanted to go places. Now you can pull it off the rear end. All right. Now you can rotate that yoke up, bring it off the guide rod, bring the guide rod out. Now you're at a point where if you truly needed to, you could access this and loosen it. And some of these nuts are super, super tight and some of these nuts are just barely there. A lot of times the nuts that are just barely there are usually on weapons or the loose nut that you find that don't cycle right. The action doesn't work right and it doesn't spit cases and it doesn't feed right and it, <laughs> it's extremely inaccurate because that nut is what holds the barrel tightly in place. And if it ain't tight, your rifle ain't tight. If your rifle ain't tight, it ain't gonna work. All right, stand by. Okay, now we've got a close-up frontal view of the gas block assembly and its attaching action rods. You got three holes. The bottom hole, that's where the forearm mounting screw goes in. The small hole in the center, that is where the gas tube about an inch long that protrudes from the rear of the gas block goes into that little hole basically does the same thing that the gas key on your AR bolt does it just provides a cavity of proper size so that when you fire around gas can be blown into that cavity to blow that action bar back the large top hole that's where the recoil spring guide rod goes all right stand by All right, now get you a good up close view of the gas tube that extends from the rear of the gas block. Very, very important. Anytime you disassemble one of these weapons and you're bringing your action bars and your block rearward, to remove your spring or your recoil guide tube. Make very certain that you do not allow, especially if you're at that point where you're starting to pull the tube up and you're still under spring tension, do not allow this block to come forward. Because if it is not in line correctly and the hole that that tube goes into is misaligned with that tube, you're going to whack the shit out of that tube. And if you do, maybe once you'll get lucky if you didn't let it travel very far, but you do that two or three times and you're going to have to revamp the mouth of that tube, if not try to find 
a replacement and it can be replaced there's an allen screw right up here but i'm going to tell you something finding that piece <laughs> you'll probably have to have somebody make you one unless you can find a junk gun somewhere that you can rob parts off of because if it gets deformed it's not going to fit right if it gets deformed or flattened it's not going to deliver gas at the proper pressure and your weapon's not going to work right. Okay, so be careful, be wary, be mindful. Do not allow anything to impact that gas tube, to crush it, to bend it, to waffle up the front end, anything. It's, it's stout, but, but this action bar under full spring tension all the way from the rear, it'd be like picking up that ball peen hammer and whacking it. And that is going to be a bad thing. Okay. Stand by. Okay. We're getting ready to go back together with this. And I was going to just do it off camera. But I want to draw your attention to something. Those of you who like to think ahead may be thinking to yourself, you know, the way that spring's in there on that tube and the way you got to pull that stuff apart and get it out, that looks like it might be a pain in the ass to go back together with. Well, you'd be partly right. <laughs> it's not an absolute pain in the ass. But it can be fairly, uh, what you might call, persnickety. Get some good light here on that. You'll notice I've got the guide tube back in the action bars. And you notice, because it's hollow, right here at one end, at the rear end, in the center of the barrel nut is a peg. Now, that rod has to go down over that peg, and the spring has to go around the rod, but it's captured, it's trapped. You can't put it in the front. So what this entails is a kind of a clabbered up damn deal where you've got to get the rod in its mounting position, in its channel that it rides in, the recess. You've got to bring it forward. You've got to start feeding the spring over the rod. And as tension builds, you've got to bring the rod a little more forward until you reach a point where you can actually get the back end of the spring over the back end of the tube, shove the tube back so that the spring is locked on the tube. Now, that's not a hard thing to do, but trying to do it on camera, I won't be able to get the right angle. So stand by while I put that back in. But be mindful once you do that. Then you can put your yoke back on pin it back into the gas block and you're completely together. Stand by. Okay, as you can see, we've got the recoil spring guide rod, recoil spring. Our discussion that holds the spring guide rod in its position and it's pinned in. It's not really hard to do. That took me about literally a minute and a half, maybe two. But it all goes back together. You reach a point where you're putting that spring over the tube and you've got it all in there and it's pretty loaded up. And you really wish that you, know, you had three hands or a really long pecker, one or the other, that could hold stuff. <laughs> a prehensile tail like a monkey would be nice. But once you do it three or four times, psh, it's old hat. All right, stand by. All righty then. Now, how's that for hijinks? Not all that complicated. Got some idiosyncrasies. Got to do it the way they did back in the late 50s, early 60s. All in all, for its design, it's pretty simple. And it certainly is. A viable weapon and you know I, I've seen it I've heard it I've seen people that owned them this I can't get this thing shoot for shit but uh, 
you do it right, that action is smooth, man, it's slick. That grease is what you need. It's going to give you better lockups. It's going to give you better travel. It's going to preserve the interior mated surfaces that have to work against one another. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you learned a little something, cool. And uh, I think there's only the one, you know just one thing left to do, and that's go out and make some noise with it. <laughs> I I think I'm going to try to talk him into taking that front side off and have that barrel thread put a suppressor on there. This would be a fun gun. Okay, so um, we're going to head out to the range and pop a few rounds with it and see what kind of accuracy we can get. Now, you'll notice the tube that's sitting on top here. That's about a 50, 55-year-old Weaver hunting scope. No variable power, fixed power. More than likely six. Itty bitty lenses, one inch tube, but reticle, bold, going to fine, nice fine reticle, and it's in damn fine shape and it worked fine when we tested it. So we'll see what it'll do for a woods rifle, for a truck gun, for drag it out the front door if you live in the country and take care of that coyote or that pig that's out there in the swimming pool. It ought to work just fine. <laughs> All right, let's grab a range bag and some bullets, a couple other things, and uh, make some noise. Stand by. Morning, folks. Howdy, neighbors. Welcome back. Uh, didn't take us long to get out here. Just an entire night. <laughs> Summertime, July 4th, Central Oklahoma too damn hot to get on a range after 9 30 so we're out here about 7 a.m <laughs> and it's palpable it's doable um just a little quick rundown of what i'm going to do now when chris and i sighted this rifle in we sighted it in for 100 yards your average hunting distance your average shot distance on most of your oklahoma big game deer pig stuff like that when you do it right is usually a little closer than that but it's always nice to have a hundred yard zero on knot six and the like. Uh, just helps give you a good, lack of a better term, combat zero. Take shots out to 200 yards without really having to worry about holdover. So what we're going to do, I've got a target set up down there at 60 yards. And that's your average, your average shot distance in Oklahoma. We're not in the desert, we're not in the mountains. We got woods, we got fields, we got hills. It's just, and that's, you know, Oklahoma Game Department standard. That's what the scientist said is the average, so we'll take it. Who am I to refute them? So what we're gonna do is, now you'll see I've got this rifle setting on my bug out bag. Um, I'm not necessarily trying to demonstrate how still I can hold the rifle or how good an offhand shot I'm going to take. What I'm wanting to do is, Chris wanted me to kind of get a feel for this ammunition that he was able to get at a good price. And it's Federal, it's Power Shock 150 hunting bullets. And just kind of curious as to, you know, the accuracy we can get. Now I ain't putting it on a lead sled and I ain't getting all down on a bench and stuff. We did that. With, with the other ammo that we sighted it in for, but we're just curious about this right here. So, we only got one magazine and that's four shots each time. So what I'm gonna do is, once I get set up and go ahead and turn that camera around, get an angle on the target, and we'll fire four shots and have to reload and four shots and have to reload and four shots. <laughs> on and on four shots at a time. It's really different than all the stuff I'm used to shooting. So without further ado, let's get that camera angle changed. We'll get some shots down range and see how the uh, early, early 70s, late 60s technology is doing at the time. Stand by.
All right, now that it looks like we're doing pretty well, let's get a little steel, what do you say? <laughs> See how this OT6 rocks that half inch plate. Rocks the shit out of it. <laughs> Got to wait forever for it to quit swinging. Try to make it loop to loop. Alrighty, whoo, she's a killer, and so far, she has cycled every round that's been thrown in her. Got you a good one, got you a good one, Chris. Stand by. Well, alrighty then, friends. Um, I think it's safe to say that the uh, circa late 60s uh, Remington 742 Woods Master that my buddy Chris owns inherited uh, He got handed down to him a damn fine weapon. I can't think of calling it anything else so uh, You know just uh, years ago. I used to Read the field and stream and the hunting and the game magazines and there was one of those magazines And I can't remember which because I'm 62 years old and it's been 40 years they had a section in there called parting shot. Well, by God, we ought to have a parting shot or two, don't you think? Um, this weapon's getting some damn fine accuracy for just regular old off-the-shelf federal. Power shock, 150 grain. It's doing a damn fine job. It's doing some pretty good accuracy off the bag, off the hood of the truck. So, shouldn't be much of an issue with anything else. And I want to thank Chris for giving me the opportunity to bring this piece out. Do a little uh, short video on it. It's <laughs> short. This thing's damn near an hour long probably. I ought to put it out in two parts, but I think I'll just drag it out in one. And if you don't want to watch it all, well, you don't have to. Just like the shooting part, come on down to this side. It happens somewhere after the 31 minute mark. Um, but like the Remingtons of old, this puppy's doing a fine job. It's spit out every case I've fed in it, and it's just doing wonderful, wonderful work for the weapon that it is and what it was designed to do. So I'm glad you guys came out to the range with me. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. I hope you learned a little bit. And as always, I'm just an old redneck with an itty-bitty paycheck, and I don't monetize. Everything I do, I do on my own hook and my own dime, except for this ammo. I didn't have to buy it. So hit that like button, hit that notification bell, get the algorithm up, and maybe, just maybe, one day, <laughs> I'll have enough of you people stopping by to watch me, that I'll have, you know, the ability to start a retirement fund. So without further ado, let's take our parting shots, what do you say? All bullseyes. <laughs> Y'all are saying, oh, bullshit. They are. Anyway, you guys have a great day. Thanks for stopping by. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Independence Day. Let's hope we get to have many, many more. I'd hate like hell I, to have to come up with a Independence Day 2.0. But damn, <laughs> it could happen. Thank you guys, I love you. Thanks for stopping by. And hopefully someday soon, in the near future, I'm gonna see you somewhere downrange. Bye.